So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large sensory house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I looked to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat, so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me. So much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there for a few years at least. Then after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. 
At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard and I saw out of the corner of my eye, my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again and the current residents have stayed there the longest. I write in a daily journal and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, the first unusual cold spot found Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there. 
but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The Babymobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. It was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st. Husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. 
Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in Old House, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, Good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. So this isn't anything too crazy, but I do have a little story about my childhood home. It was the summer of 2012. Life was good, and I was up at 2 a.m. watching Teen Nick in my house's den. The whole house was always fascinating to me. One of the first houses built in our small town in Kansas during the Prohibition as a moonshiner's illegal party house. The whole house is a colonial style, full of Victorian features. From the outside, it looks like a two-story, but there are actually three floors and a half a basement. The architecture was always confusing as to how this was accomplished, but wedged between the top and main floor is a log cabin-themed room, our family room and den. It was a glorified bar room fitted with a monstrous fireplace an Alaskan moose head from about 1920, and a salvaged chandelier from the former Douglas Opera House. I always hated being in that room at night because I always got a weird sensation, like someone standing over me, when I would try to sleep on the couch after a long night of TV. My best friend and I also felt like this from time to time, sleeping in my own bed, which used to be the master suite. Never could get the cat or the dog to hang out in the den, though. Its door was an inch thick of solid wood and had a very complex lock that remained tucked inside its latch since no previous owners had the key. We never bothered to close it. It would get stuck in the frame because it was so heavy, designed to keep the police out if someone tipped off a booze party. There was a nursery on the top floor that shared a wall with this room. It was sold to us with no doorknob to the small four by 10 room. It became our home office. There was a brand new computer and an all-in-one printer and fax machine that remained unplugged, rarely used. My bedroom was right next to it and I always slept with my door open. In the middle of the night, I could often see the computer light up and paper would cycle through the printer, the unplugged printer could never get myself to check it out until the morning. Whenever I looked on the sheets, there was nothing on them, and we would just load them back inside. It was my sister and I's favorite place to pirate scary movies. We would close the door so as not to disturb mom and dad since it didn't latch. But one night, she left me in the room to go get a snack, and when she came back, she couldn't open the door. I was trapped inside. My mom had to use a butter knife to force the handle. I was kind of shook given the timing. But back to the den. I'm minding my teen Nick business when out of the blue I get a call from my friend. She tells me that she's doing a Ouija board session, which I've always done my part to stay far away from. She says that her presence told her to call me. She informed me that I was wearing a black shirt which I was, and I only own one. I hung up the call and immediately went to my bedroom to wait out the next few hours to daylight. That same summer, my mom, grandma, sister, and I went on one of our late night drives where we would blast oldies cruising the back roads. As we were driving, an unidentifiable creature ran in front of our car and across the road. None of us agreed on what we saw. We thought that it was a very large white rabbit or cat or small dog. It was moving unthinkably fast for any of those animals though. It made it across the road in two hops. At the time, we joked about it and kept on our way. When we got home and stepped into the foyer, heavy work boots start down the upstairs hall and down the stairs. They stop at the den level. From the foyer, you can see the part of the staircase that leads to the den, and no one is there. 
We're all looking at each other, waiting for my father to continue his trip down the stairs. Then he comes up from the basement, followed by our dog. The cat is chilling in a window on the main floor. We sent him upstairs to investigate. He checked everywhere, even the attic, and there was nothing. Could all be a coincidence. When we moved into an apartment that fall, nothing else strange seemed to happen though. I'm tempted to ask the family who lives there now if they've ever experienced anything. The original owners are buried in the morgue just down the street. And sometimes I think they make a trip to their old home. All the homes in my neighborhood were built in 2009 or 2010, seven homes in all. One of the homes across the street was purchased by a single female with two boys and a child on the way. Her boyfriend did live with her, but didn't help purchase the home, and he was not a good guy. They fought all the time. I'm pretty sure he was on meth, and he cheated on her constantly. He even tried to approach me. So, I reiterate, not a good guy. Toward the end, he started getting abusive. She had him locked up, but let him come back when he got out. One day, an ambulance showed up at the home. We were all told that he had committed suicide, had gotten high on meth and shot himself in the bathroom. All right, this was believable. After his death, she asked me to help her watch the home as his friends and family were accusing her of killing him and were pulling up into her driveway and then leaving and basically just trying to harass her. I thought this was suspicious, but whatever. As a single mom, she had to work all the time. The oldest boy would watch the little one while she worked. He would always come down to my house to stay, but wouldn't tell me why. But I liked the kid, so no worries. About four years went by like this and she told me she was moving. I was kind of shocked because these were really nice homes and fairly cheap, but I figured it was just because of what had happened previously. Finally, she told me that they were moving because of the paranormal activity in the home since his death. The little one was the most bothered by it and that's why he stayed at my house all the time. She proceeded to tell me what really happened. They were in a fight and he had a gun in his hand and was threatening to shoot her. They had a struggle over the gun, resulting in him shooting himself behind the ear. He fell to the ground, crawled down the hallway, and died in the living room. The little one said that he could see him at night, crawling down the hallway. The doors would open and close on their own, and they would hear disembodied voices and feel negative energy, stuff like that. She said her guests would see and hear stuff too. She wouldn't go into much detail and I understood why I didn't press the issue. The boys were struggling in school and she wasn't doing so well either. They moved and the house sat empty for about a year now. Well, my daughter and her husband have decided to purchase this home. I asked them what they would do if they saw him crawling down the hallway at night. They joke about it, but I mean, come on, that would be some scary shit. If you've never really experienced anything paranormal before, or hell, even if you had. My son-in-law is a huge skeptic, but my daughter has had some experiences. I wonder if it's still active or if he moved on when they left. A morbid part of me can't wait to find out. In order to set a little background, this took place in Western Wyoming. It was a small town, and at the time it had maybe 2,500 people. This was the first home that I lived in during the time that I spent in Wyoming. We moved here because of my dad's job. The family and I weren't very enthusiastic because we loved our home in Oklahoma. 
My dad and mom went up and looked for houses without us so that we could finish school and wouldn't have to stay in a hotel. The housing market wasn't doing so well and the choices were very limited. In fact, it came down to one choice. The house that we had to move into was built in the 1930s and it was rather different from the house we moved out of. It was single story with a large basement. The staircase to the basement was immediately to the left when you walked into the front door. No door at the bottom and the steps were steep. It was fairly dark without any lights on. We move in within three weeks of being told that we're moving. My dad spent the first night there alone and never told us what he experienced until years later. We were about eight to 13 years old between my brother and sister, so he didn't want to scare us. He decided to sleep in the basement because the TV was down there and the basement was fairly large. He said that it was late, around 2 a.m., when the TV turned on to static by itself. He's not bothered too much by it, but then he hears a door creak open and some footsteps. After doing a little investigating, he lays down again, but doesn't sleep much due to weird noises. Jumping forward sometime, this would be my first odd experience that would make me a believer later on in life. Every night, my sister and I would pick a VHS movie from a large bookshelf in the basement. Since I was too afraid to sleep in my room in the basement, we slept in a bunk in my sister's room. My mom tells us that it's time to put in a movie and go to bed, so we agree to head downstairs. My first choice was one of my two favorites, which was The Land Before Time. I asked my sister without turning around, does Land Before Time sound good to you? After about a minute, I get impatient and I say, well, how about The Lion King then? Not much more time passes and I get upset and I tell her, Fine then, if you're not going to say anything, we're going to watch my movie. As I slowly turn around to address my sister, I see that nobody is there. Here's the real kicker. I look back to the large bookcase and see two shadows, plain as day. My shadow, which is to the left, and a smaller shadow that clearly looks like a little girl on the right. This is when I realize something is not right and I freak out. After screaming and starting up the stairs, I take one final look back to see that the little girl is moving down the hallway to my room. Well, at least her shadow is. There was absolutely nobody in the basement to produce that shadow. The shadow disappears into my room and then to top it off, the light comes on. So I'm screaming bloody murder at this point and I run to tell my parents. They tell me that it was just my imagination so then I ask where my sister is, and they tell me that she's been in her room waiting for me to bring up a movie. Again, years later, I get told that they had both seen a little girl in the house too. They knew full well that it was not my imagination. The last thing that happened was to my brother. He had a room in the basement, but he wasn't a chicken like I was. One late night, he was woken up to his door creaking open. He thought it was me because sometimes I would get scared and come sleep with him. After a few moments, he said a small head peeked through the door. He said, what's wrong, buddy? Can't sleep? The door slowly shuts and he hears footsteps down the hall to my room. He decides to get up and come see what, who he thought was me, was doing. After leaving his room, he sees my light is on and my door is open. He walks into the room and every single toy from my wooden toy box is out. This is very unusual for me because my parents were quite strict and would kick my butt if I left my room like that. He asks me the next day what I was doing down in my room so late and I had no idea what he was talking about. My mom vouched that I was passed out in her room after we all watched movies. To sum up this story, my brother and I both had recurring dreams about a little blonde girl being stuffed into my toy box in the closet. Another dream that we both had was this kind of tall old man beating us in the basement bathroom. 
We've come to think that maybe a kid was killed in that house and the negative energy manifested because of that. Something I forgot to mention, all the toys were cleaned up the next day and were meticulously placed, all standing up in an odd order. Nobody in my family ever placed them like that, and no one had been in the basement aside from my brother, and he said that he certainly didn't do it. In any case, I'm really glad we don't live there anymore. When I was a young child, about 10 or 11, I moved into a small country town. I've been there before and my parents grew up there. Everyone who lives there knows that the whole town is haunted, from the school and even the church hall to everything else. And once it goes dark, most people who live there go inside because you can see spirits walking in dark places and that's pretty much the extent of it. But the house that I lived in had a spirit who likes to mimic voices, specifically of your loved ones, and even likes to look like them. It would only target me and my older sisters, and only when we were home alone. I would wake up with bruises and scratches, same as my sister. One time I was home alone and heard my older sister call out for me from our room. I got up and saw her walk into our room just slightly, but I could tell it was her. I called her name, but she didn't answer, so I followed her in. I entered our room and saw that it was empty. I thought that she was messing with me, but she's pretty tall, so there wasn't really anywhere she could hide. Then, suddenly, I heard the front door open. I went and saw my older sister, with the rest of my family, coming home. She hadn't been there. This wasn't the first time that something like this happened, and it certainly wasn't the last. Fortunately, I moved out of there about two years ago, and I've never woken up with a random bruise or scratch ever again. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around checking up on us. I sprinted to the door and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom, and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, 
but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball, and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker, it was just a regular lid and pot. Another time we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs, and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there, and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night, and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house. A boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new house. 
Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home, and before that, I have no idea. My partner, our young children, and I have lived here since it was built, nearly six years ago. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest child's bedroom. It was her bedroom from about six months old until about two years. She never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crappy sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we would bring her into our room, which was directly next to her room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway. And if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, a boy, now has that bedroom and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest daughter's bedroom, she would wake in the night and my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle and I would go in to comfort her. While comforting her with my back to the door, I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me, so much so that I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. During a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. We asked her how she slept, totally normal question and we certainly didn't lead her answer in any way. She said, eh, not so great, I felt on edge like somebody was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, I just felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I had felt in the past when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before, so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. A friend recommended we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room, and we might do that. But I just wanted to share this story and see if anybody else can relate. When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint, and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly, and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. 
I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch The Breakfast Club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities. Some good, some not. The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. It's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. A couple of years ago, I experienced a moment straight out of the Truman Show. I was skiing on Whistler Mountain with my family. I'm a fast skier. So I usually will zip down the mountain and then wait for my dad to catch up with my phone in hand in case he needs to reach me. One run, I stopped about halfway down the mountain to wait for him to catch up and received a phone call from my dad. When I picked up, he didn't answer. Instead, 
I heard what sounded like radio chatter. I couldn't make out exactly what was being said, except for one thing. We lost him. Wait, wait, he stopped by the tree. Then the line went dead and my dad came skiing down. Not only was he not on his phone, but his phone was dead. I told my family about this and even had the phone call record in my recent phone calls as evidence that I had at least received a call when I claimed I did. What was especially strange is that my younger brother had a memory of the event as well. He said that I had skied to the bottom of the mountain where he was eating lunch and that I had received the call in front of him, but I didn't. He also told me the next morning that he had a nightmare that men in suits were standing all around his bed telling him to forget what he had seen and that, quote, he could never know the truth, he being me. He could have easily been messing with me, sure, but he seemed really shaken up at the time, like genuinely scared, and he's still fascinated by the events whenever I bring them up today. When this happened, it completely shattered my worldview about reality. I still find myself questioning what's real, it was a very strange event. I feel like I was never supposed to experience it. Like I said, it eerily reminds me of that scene in the Truman Show where his car radio is playing security radio chatter of them following him. I don't know what to make of it, but it was really, really strange. So I always thought this was strange. I even told people about it, but chalked it up to people working overnight or something. But now, I'm not so sure. I worked for one of the biggest tech companies for about 10 years. I traveled a lot and sometimes taught workshops. I remember visiting Puerto Rico to deliver a workshop. I was really impressed with the people in the office. They were serving lunch on silver dishes and had a really classy atmosphere. It was a company location, so there were no customers in the office. One strange thing that happened, but not necessarily weird, was after eating lunch with the students, I'd started teaching again. And little by little, the office people would just casually walk in, right past the projector and me lecturing and grab lunch. I wasn't mad, I actually found it kind of funny. Besides, the staff had some good looking and generally nice people, so there's that too. The strange part was that I remember after one class cleaning up for the night and visiting the bathroom before leaving, and I noticed that it was a bit aged. Maybe leaking faucets and water stains, nothing gross, but it was definitely an old bathroom. There were several stalls and urinals. Now, I left likely at around five o'clock and the office was closing down. The next day when I visited that bathroom, it was completely different and looked brand spanking new. I'm talking marble, tile, everything looked like it had literally been done overnight. I remember mentioning this and really getting no response from anybody. That night was when the oil refinery blew up. I booked my flight a day early and got out. I was afraid that it was either an attack or the smoke would force the airport to be closed down, which would cause havoc with me trying to get home. I never did figure out what was going on there with that bathroom or with the people. Looking back on it, maybe they weren't real either, or maybe it was some kind of glitch. I've mentioned this a few times to people over the years as a funny story, thinking that they had actually remodeled this bathroom overnight. But now that I think of it, there's no possible way that they did that. I was leaving when the office was getting ready to close. There were no signs, no workers coming in and no recollection of the employees the next day. Plus, this work wasn't just a makeover. Like I said, it was granite counters, tile walls, the works. It was just very strange.
Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings. So at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the serial draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud ugly pants just drew attention to his loud ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did, can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change, and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this it appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. 
We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. This wasn't anything mind-blowing, but it happened to me earlier today, and it made me so confused. I live in an apartment building, and the ground level is like a communal public space. I was taking the lift down from my apartment level to this ground level to exit the place in the morning. The lift doors have transparent panels, so you can look out of the lift. And because of how lifts usually slow down when they're reaching the destination floor, and the doors sometimes take a few seconds to open. I had a good 10 seconds to look at what was happening at the public space in the ground floor. From what I saw, there were three men mopping the floor and one old lady, who I know is my neighbor, was walking across the space in front of these three men. But when I was in the lift, I noticed that all four of them were frozen, but it was weird because they weren't just standing in casual positions. The men looked like they had just frozen as they were mopping, and the old lady was literally mid-stride. I spent a good three or four seconds wondering what was going on as I waited for the lift doors to open. But the moment the lift doors opened and I stepped out, everyone started moving. The men went back to mopping the floor, and the lady continued walking again. It was so odd, though, because it literally looked as though somebody had pressed play on them when I stepped out of the lift. It was so weird to me. I have no idea what happened. This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery for the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving nightlights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm. Not hard, but firm. And he whispered, What the hell? While looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m., and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. 
My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it, though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. 
Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled, and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're going to stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place. It's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there, and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching was six to seven feet tall and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade because ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story.
Last Thursday in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in, because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by, and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal. But 
it's really hard to tell what happened. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. She bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. 
As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her, because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. 
I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual, but I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And true to his word, we never went back in there again. My name is Luna, and I'm 35 years old, and I'm a hospice nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for the last 10 years. This is a story about a young woman I took care of that I became very close to. The patient in question was 23 years old and was dying of liver cancer. She was given about six months when she was told she was terminal and was put on hospice. I started going to her house twice a week at first, and we really liked each other. As she started slowly going downhill, I started coming more and more until I was there every day. Most of the time, we would just sit and talk. She was a very pretty girl with long black hair and blue eyes. She was very athletic and active before she got cancer, so not being able to do things for herself or get up and around without help was very hard for her. She always wore a minty smelling perfume, which I liked very much. I was with her the day she died, and that was a very hard day for me. I got home pretty late that day, and I made dinner for myself, and sat down in the living room in front of the television. I had been sitting there for about five minutes, when I smelled a minty smell that was just like my patient's perfume. Then I heard a cough, and a female voice call my name. I looked over toward the kitchen and there was my patient standing beside the kitchen counter. She just looked at me and she was smiling and then she waved and disappeared. I think it was just her way of saying she was okay. Sometimes to this day, I still feel like she's watching over me. Sometimes I still smell her perfume, especially if I've had a hard day.
I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister home alone. One day we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace when my sister said, what? From right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room and she said no. I told my sister what happened and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. My boyfriend passed at the end of March and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts in the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry, I couldn't scream, I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. 
My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay and was keeping me safe. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup. A new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. 
I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with, and arranged them in a ten-foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and ten feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off, and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And, frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge, and I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before, and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. 
I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. <laughs> I thought it was a wildfire he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I, I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it, I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. 
Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered, we were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer, and we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold like really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. 
I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp, but Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out, like it's out cold, and it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks, and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. And that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. 
even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, 
casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse, eventually the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night. But I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general. But who knows? I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. 
those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home, and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord, and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior, and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick, and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she'd left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought, and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow, and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book, and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's, and one day, she the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock, and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it, and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. 
After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought, because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans, and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much, and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. A family member bought this little box with a mirror inside, like a jewelry box, at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, but then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer, thought it was a great price, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out. She brought it into the home, into a room near the kitchen, and left it there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table, and then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied person coming up on her. She heard something make a sound in her left ear. She said that she can't remember the exact sound, but when she originally told me, it was almost like a negative, ah. It wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, somewhere in the middle. It made her jump and made her let out a loud shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave and that they were not welcome there. She said it out loud several times and in the garage and inside and outside the house. She placed a Bible on the object and held a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought somebody was trying to play a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her but there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom, quite a distance away, and another person was on a totally separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking and yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what had just happened. This all happened very quickly, around 5.40 p.m. local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, brought home, and then very strange things started happening. For example, an antique wooden clock that was purchased in another state would hang on the wall 
and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if somebody had moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room, but nobody messed with the clock and nobody turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name as if somebody was calling for you, but no one actually was. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this home. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it wasn't welcome. The other experiences did not feel negative, maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on. It's still very infrequent though, off and on. While writing this story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote, things like that. And while trying to save images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with this and is just a software issue, but who knows? Update. The object has been donated to the Goodwill. She sent texts to four different people after donating it and included an image of the place that it was donated. The images disappeared or showed up blank or with a note saying that they weren't able to view it. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to what's going on here. Any insight, feedback or comments would be greatly appreciated.